Realm Presents Remade, Season 1, Episode 14. Hello, Holden. She was a young woman, with a wry smile that might have been teasing on a crueler face. Pretty features, but not remarkably so. The kind of face that put you instantly at ease. The only problem was, Holden wasn't sure if she was even there. The control room he'd been led to looked as if it hadn't been occupied in centuries. When the young woman moved, Holden caught glimpses of dust motes floating around her and through her, like a flashlight beam shone through a dusty attic doorway. Her smile turned serious. We need to talk. Who are you? He asked. I'm Arcadia. Where are you? He gestured at the walls of screens around him. I mean, you're not in the room with me. This is some kind of hologram, right? The young woman, Arcadia, offered him a self-conscious shrug. Literally speaking, I suppose I'm not in the room with you, no. It's more that I am the room, and this tower. I am this city's central artificial intelligence, and you're more or less standing in my brain. Even though he knew she was speaking figuratively, Holden shifted his feet uncomfortably. Perhaps he should have been shocked. Perhaps he should have run screaming. But he'd known when he followed that tiny wisp of light and gotten into the car without a driver that he was in for something unexpected. A central computer running a city? keeping the lights on long after the people were gone? Fine. He could handle that, as long as he got what he was looking for. He stepped closer. I want answers. Ask me questions. Why are we here? Arcadia cocked her head. To rest and recuperate. Holden didn't like her sudden switch to speaking literally. It felt put on, like a game she was playing. I was driving in a car with a girl. A passing truck veered into our lane and he paused. The memory of that night stuck in his throat like a pit. Saya smiling, wiping the smear of glitter paint off his neck. The small lie that started it all. Then I woke up in space surrounded by those things, the caretakers. Why? You were plucked from your place in the timeline and brought into this time. To you, it's the far future. How far? One thousand years, as best as I can figure it. As best as you can figure it? You mean you're not responsible? No. The caretakers were responsible for that. A small group of them, at least. Why? Because that's what they were programmed to do. Arcadia held up her hands as Holden started to interrupt. We can keep talking, but I need you to do something for me first. I reached out to you alone because I've been watching you, Holden. Out of everyone, I knew you would be the most open to hearing what I have to say. But it's not without consequences. Real consequences that will affect every one of you. For a moment, Arcadia flickered. There was static, then a jumble of images too brief to identify like a TV channel switched over and then quickly back again. But whatever had happened, it passed, and she smiled again. Those consequences will affect me, too. So before we talk any further, I want you to do something, please. I need you to bring someone to see me. She'll never come on her own, and I really need to talk to the two of you, together. Hello, Holden? Out of the blue, that's what it said? Inez cocked her head to the side in her best, you're shitting me pose. Inez. Why the fuck did the city want to talk to Inez? Holden tried not to let his annoyance show. Yeah, that's what she said, and not much else. Except she wants to talk to both of us about something important. Just you and me. Hiram glanced around. Wait, the city's a she? Cool, said May. Totally not cool. Loki looked up from cleaning his gun thingy. He'd stationed himself in one of the windows so he could keep an eye on all the exits. 
They had gathered together in the lobby of one of the hotels downtown. It had been designed like a classic atrium, and the tall windows and marble arches gave it a Roman Senate feel. The hotel was definitely one of the better preserved structures, almost perfectly intact. They'd wondered about that, how the heart of the city could be in such good condition when all the people were long gone. Now they knew. You guys do realize this means we are basically living inside a giant AI, said Loki. Like a caretaker? Could be watching everything we do, planning with those other bots outside for the best time to wipe us all out. I don't see any cameras around, said Hiram. Yeah? Check the vents the next time you're taking a piss. Hiram's cheeks blushed red as he crossed his legs. The news that they were all living inside a sentient city had left them all shaken, and as far as Holden was concerned, that was a good thing. They'd become way too complacent in way too short a time. Soon their most pressing concerns would go from, what do we do about those caretakers outside, to, why does he get first pick of the penthouse suites and not me? Holden knew that there was already talk about moving out of the medical center to this very hotel. On the one hand, it made sense. This place had all the comforts the medical center didn't. The group was ready to stop running, and the hotel, the city itself, looked like it could actually become a home. But they were letting down their guards. It was obvious that May and Gabe at least had hooked up, probably others. It was surprisingly easy for the rest to get used to feeling safe again. Not Holden. At night, he still dreamed of Jing Wei's lifeless face, half of it burned clear off, staring up at him. She dominated his waking thoughts, too. He couldn't escape the idea that he had somehow failed her. Jing Wei was a builder. She had been a strong personality, yes, but too preoccupied with the minutia of what could be done to really think about the bigger picture. It made her a bad leader, and Holden had let her do it anyway. Holden had known in his gut that staying put in the old camp was a bad idea, but Jing Wei had insisted they stay. She'd wanted to build a new home. He'd backed down rather than step up, and because of that, the caretakers had found them and she was dead. Others too. Poor Wesley, who'd been torn apart. All he had to do to conjure their ghosts was close his eyes. Umta and Loki were the only other people who felt like Holden did. Umta spent most of her time in the large park on the western edge of town. From the trees there, she kept watch for caretakers and for dangers as yet undiscovered. Holden visited her often and they talked, even though the strange woman had changed since the massacre. She had turned more, well, he hated to even think it, but bestial would have been the word. As for Loki, he was always on alert. He'd set himself a schedule of regular patrols through the city streets on some kind of wheeled vehicle he'd discovered that reminded Holden of those hoverboards that had gotten so popular back in their day, the ones that kept blowing up. Some of the others laughed at Loki when he wasn't looking. Some were worried about him. If you asked Holden, Loki was one of the few who hadn't forgotten where the hell they were. As for the rest... Maybe it took Arcadia to remind them. He'd known when he summoned them all to the hotel lobby that he was about to burst everyone's bubble, and he'd be lying if he said he hadn't enjoyed it just a little. Then again, panic wouldn't help anyone. Look, let's not jump to conclusions, he said, calling for order. Arcadia's not like the caretakers. She's something... different. Wait, she's got a name, too? said Inez. You two got chummy pretty fast. Cities have names, Inez. You ever hear of New York, San Francisco? Saya surprised everyone by snapping, Jesus, will you two just cut it out? As she stormed out of the room, Holden felt the looks. He and Saya had barely spoken since coming to the city. People had noticed. And now everyone was wondering if their friendship was in real trouble. No one thought to look at Inez. You want me to go after her? Asked Hiram, standing up. No, Holden quickly blocked the boy's path. Uh, thanks though, Hiram. We're all under a lot of stress. Let's give her some time. He could just imagine Hiram offering to pray with Saya. Worse, he could imagine what Saya's response would be. 
We still need to hear more about the city, said Nevea. Since coming to the city, she'd started wearing her hair short, shorn close to the skin. Their lives had really taken a turn if they could find the time for haircuts. Sad, then, that the time was about to be over. What little perverse thrill Holden had gotten from bursting their bubble of complacence vanished. Nevea's right, said Holden. Like I said before, the city calls herself Arcadia, or at least that's what the humans called this place when they lived here. So it was humans, definitely? Asked Gabe. Not some other kind of bot? Humans. She ran the streetlights, controlled the climate systems, generally took care of everyone. Oh, sorry, poor choice of words. She hasn't spoken to anyone in a long, long time. Inez had that look again. God, Holden hated that look. And she said she has something important to tell us? She asked. Why didn't you just go ahead and tell you? Why all mysterious? That was the part where things could go really, really south. Because it was the part that worried Holden, too. And she said she had something big to say, something important. And she wants to tell it to me and Inez. Me? Inez did a double take. Why me? Holden didn't look at her. I don't know, but she wouldn't tell me whatever it is alone. The group was quiet for a moment as this was digested. At last, Gabe said what was on everyone's mind. Shit, that doesn't sound good. Maybe, said Holden. We don't know for sure. What do you think then? Holden sighed. I think it doesn't sound good. Loki began to pace. Anyone ever watch The Twilight Zone? I'm getting a real to serve man vibe here. Shut the fuck up, Loki, said Inez. Did she give you any hints at all, Holden? Did she sound, like, pissed off or anything? Holden shrugged. She sounded calm. But what do you expect a citywide AI to sound like? I don't think there's any reason to freak out, though. If she'd wanted to hurt us, there would have been plenty of opportunities before now. I mean, don't forget, something is keeping all the caretakers out. I think it's pretty obvious that something is the city itself. It's Arcadia. Okay, said Inez. Assuming we learn whatever this ultimate secret is, 42, Loki whispered too loudly. Shut up, Loki. He gave her the finger and resumed his watch near the window. Inez continued. So do we just walk on over to her? You and me? Loki stood up and checked his rivet gun. I'll go with you guys. Watch your backs. Holden put a hand on his friend's shoulder. We'll be fine. But could you go fill Umta in? She must have forgotten. That was a lie. Umta was invited to every group meeting, every dinner. But she never showed up. Still, she was one of them. She had a right to know what was going on. All right, said Inez. If we're going to do this, let's do this. The meeting started to break up. People milled about, uncertain and scared. Holden took Loki aside. I need you to do something for me. Yeah, I'll tell Umta, no sweat, but not that. Holden lowered his voice. You've been mapping the city, right? On your patrols? Street layout, yeah. I'm planning on doing the sewers and tunnels next. I want you to go on foot and follow the main avenue all the way downtown to the city center. There you'll find a tall silver tower with no windows. That's Arcadia's operating center. See if you can find the power supply. It seems like a citywide AI would need a whole lot of power, right? Loki nodded slowly. You mean, in case we need to shut it down? In case whatever this Arcadia has to say isn't so great for us? Like Skynet? Holden grinned. Something like that. Just see if you can find it. Umta can help you. Loki nodded and tried some kind of awkward fist pump that went nowhere. Alone and in groups, people drifted out of the lobby until at last it was just Holden and Inez alone together. The look was gone, and she just waited for him, arms folded across her chest, patiently watching. So, how are we going to get to see the wizard? We walking? Holden grinned, 
He'd been waiting for this part. Nah, let's Uber. So we're walking along, singing, right? Because that's what they tell you to do to keep the bears away, you sing. Dad's voice carried all the way into the kitchen, where Holden retreated to contemplate the ridiculously stereotypical American tradition of combating grief with casseroles. He didn't know if bringing food to a wake was common in other cultures, but by his count there were nine different casseroles on the counter, and only a couple of them had even been cut into. Several more had their tinfoil unwrapped, even though the casserole inside was untouched, as if someone had snooped into the contents and thought better of it. Nine. For a household of only three, make that two. People. Maybe he could convince some of the guests to take a few home, but wasn't that rude to take home leftovers from a wake? The sight of it all turned Holden's stomach. His dad had made him force down a hard-boiled egg for breakfast, but other than that, he'd pretty much been living on Pepto and Mountain Dew for the last 48 hours, from the visitation through the funeral. He desperately wanted now to escape the kitchen, but he could hear that his dad had planted himself in the living room next door and was telling a drunken story about a hiking trip he'd taken with mom, the one where they'd seen a bear shitting in the woods. That was the whole punchline right there. You could tell it in a single sentence, but his dad kept at it, over and over again to anyone who'd listen. All those years he'd shared his life with her, and the bear shitting story was the best he could do. Every time it got longer and slurrier. Was awake officially over when the widower passed out? Jesus, Holden hoped so. Do you know what that bear was doing? Honest to God, you won't believe this. Holden turned and bolted for the stairs, not making a scene, but getting as far away from this dumpster fire as he could. It was quieter upstairs, and for some reason Holden peeked inside his parents' bedroom. He himself had tossed out the catheter bag, the plastic tubing, and the plastic bed sheets, but the room still smelled like urine. Urine and Lysol. Someone must have gotten carried away with spraying disinfectant. Probably one of the nice hospice workers who'd come in to collect and flush what was left of the pain meds. Probably the same one who'd pressed a Jesus Loves card into Holden's hand as he'd watched the gurney being loaded into the van. The hospice lady was gone, but the card was still downstairs on the dining table. The last he'd seen, it was a coaster for someone's half-empty bottle of Sam Adams. He began to pull the door closed, careful not to make a sound, when he realized he was doing it out of habit. He gave the door a hard tug instead. The click sounded like a gunshot going off. Holden found a couple of younger cousins in his own bedroom playing a computer game. Both boys were maybe 10, 11 years old, and dressed in overstarched white shirts and pressed dress pants. No ties, thank God. He barely knew them, although he seemed to remember one of them had a girl's name. Someone had obviously deposited them in here to keep them out of the way, probably because his dad's bare story got more profanity laden with each telling. On the screen in front of them was a landscape of pixelated trees at night. Thanks to the first person view, he could see one arm carrying a torch and the other a primitive knife. He knew the game well. The forest? he asked. They looked at him, somewhat guiltily, and the bigger of the two said, Mom said we could, it's cool, you go ahead. Carrie, that was the boy's girl name. Holden stayed in the doorway for a few minutes, watching them play. At one point, he almost warned them to turn left instead of turning right. Right led to a pit trap, but then that's what made the game fun, not knowing. He was halfway down the hall when he heard one of them exclaim, Aw, oh, what the shit? Well, they'd found the pit. If his room was occupied, maybe he could hide out back with the smokers. But as he came down the steps, he was cornered by his uncle George, his dad's little brother. She was something else, your mom. Judging from his bourbon breath, he'd joined Holden's dad in a few toasts. George put his arm around Holden's shoulders, patted him on the head like he was 12. 
Did you know your mom and dad met in the school play? Yeah, I've heard the story. Who'd have pegged those two as actors? But man, back in the day. George kept on talking about the ill-fated production of Oklahoma when Holden's parents missed an entrance because they were kissing backstage. But Holden wasn't listening. He was watching the girl who'd just come through the front door. He hadn't expected to see Lori here, but there she was, looking intimidated and not at all herself. In an ironically sweet move, she'd toned down the goth thing. Awake for Holden's mom, and it was the one day she wasn't wearing black. George squinted at him. It was funny. Nothing, excuse me for a minute, Uncle George. I see one of my friends. Lori was so relieved to see him that she surprised him with a kiss. It turned a few heads. Oh, thank God. All these people and I'm terrible with strangers. Oh, wait, sorry, this isn't about me. Lori stepped back and took his face in her hands. How are you holding up? Good question. But he wasn't sure he had an answer. I can't eat. I guess being sad makes me puke. Do you have to stay? I'm happy to if you do, but do you want to go? Lori looked up at him. Her blonde hair was pulled back so that the black tips weren't that obvious. She still had in all of her earrings, though. She had the smallest ears. Holden followed her left ear down her neck to where her blouse opened up a little too wide and exposed her collarbone. She had a spray of freckles there. He'd never noticed it before. Let's go. Let's get the hell away from here, okay? Inez looked understandably skeptical when Holden led her around back and down the stairs. When they reached the door to the street, she stopped. So, you gonna try and fight me for your girl? That what this is about? What? Christ, no. But when Holden turned around, Inez was smiling. It was a joke, of course it was. And that was a good thing, too, because he had a suspicion he'd lose that fight. Sorry, I know I'm on edge. We all are, she gestured to the door. But seriously, why are we down here? This where the city talks to you? Uh, sorta, you'll see. Holden threw open the door and stepped out into the sunshine. Waiting for them was a sleek hover car. It was pristine white and looked more like porcelain than metal. The front doors were open. She sent you a car? Asked Inez as she stepped outside. Yeah, I left that part out because I didn't want to freak out the others. But Arcadia controls all the vehicles in the city. The ones that still work anyway. And more than that, I suspect. Like, she controls the lights and stuff? I think she is the lights and stuff. I don't think there's a single part of this city that's not you know, fundamentally her. Wow. You sure do like your secrets, don't you, Holden? I didn't want people to panic, Holden said, trying to keep the defensiveness out of his voice. That wouldn't have helped anyone. It's great that you get to make that decision for us. Inez brushed past him and plopped down into the driver's seat. I'm driving. With a shake of his head, Holden crossed around to the other side. There's no steering wheel, you dickhead, he said under his breath. He climbed into the passenger seat and the doors slowly slid shut around them. Inez was staring in confusion at the dashboard. There's no steering wheel. Holden tried to look surprised. The car started moving with barely a jolt. It was a perfectly smooth ride as they pulled away from the hotel and started downtown. Main Street Arcadia was surreal. This one street and the buildings around it were perfectly maintained, while the rest of the city was overgrown and crumbling. Unblemished glass towers passed by, pedestrian crosswalk lights changed at regular intervals, and the car waited patiently at each one. It was like they'd slipped into a bubble, through a window into a different world. All that was missing here was the people. Inez glanced around nervously. All right, this is creeping me out, driving through a ghost town. I know what you mean. I'm guessing it's on some kind of automatic traffic mode. Probably be faster to walk. 
Holden watched the lonely storefronts and empty cafes. Uh, look, Inez, I'm actually glad we have this chance to talk. She looked at him, expressionless. What's on your mind? Two things, actually. Uh, one, I wanted to tell you, you're a natural leader. Everyone can see it. Arcadia probably sees it. It makes sense for you to be here. Inez didn't object. You're welcome for the compliment, added Holden, annoyed. I'm waiting for the second thing. Holden took a deep breath. Fine. The second is more of a question. I wanted to ask you, is Saya gay? What? I know you two kissed. Inez paused. She told you? No, I saw you. Inez looked just a little crestfallen at his answer. Was she hoping that Saya had confessed her undying love for her? If so, Inez was more of a romantic than even he was. You were spying on us? Asked Inez. I'm not a creep. I happen to wander by, but that's not my point here. Holden searched for the words. I, I mean, the kiss. That's something girls just do sometimes, right? Man, Holden, you spent a lot of time on the wrong websites. I'm being serious, and I don't know what to tell you. Honestly, my gaydar is for shit, okay? Inez turned and pressed her hand against the window, watching the city go by. All I know is we kissed. I'm a lesbian, Holden, full on. But other people are at different points on the spectrum, you know? You want to know where Saya is? Ask her. Holden studied her for a moment. She's not talking to you either, is she? No, you happy now? He didn't say so, but he was. Because it meant that someday, perhaps, Saya would see him the way he saw her. A fool's hope, maybe, but at least he wasn't necessarily up against biology. Also, in a strange way, it made him feel a little less alone. Is this the moment in the movie where I buy you a beer? Inez smiled. I don't drink beer. Sorry to break your stereotype, but I like fruity drinks. That's okay, so do I. The ones with the little umbrellas. Inez laughed again. Not the sarcastic snort he'd been on the receiving end of so many times, but an honest-to-God belly laugh. It was contagious. Holden joined in. You're picturing it, aren't you? He said. And I'm drinking it on the beach, sunscreen on my nose and the whole bit. Sorry, but yes, totally. As their laughter died, Inez wiped her eyes. Ooh, that was good. Yeah. Inez looked at him. For what it's worth, I am sorry. I know she's not your girl, but it was obvious you're into her, and that's not normally how I play things. Thanks. It's just... Inez drummed her fingers on the dashboard. It's hard when you might be the last lesbian on Earth. Holden understood, or at least he thought he did. He respected Saya and valued their friendship above just about everything else. It was the one good thing that had come of all this. But in his secret heart, there wasn't anyone else for him. It was still Saya, and it had been since before any of this began. There was still obviously a whole range of other issues he and Inez did not see eye to eye on, maybe they never would. But on the matter of Saya's heart, at least, Holden felt like they'd established a detente. And just in time, too, as right then the car slowed to a gentle stop outside Arcadia's control center. The car doors opened and they stepped out in front of a silver spire gleaming in the sunlight. All right, said Holden. Let's hear what the city has to say. Lori's artwork was mostly simple black and white drawings, but a few had a splash of color here and there. That's what attracted Holden to them, the splashes of color. Doll-eyed girls wandering past skeletal trees. The same girls dancing in fancy ball gowns. In one, a colorless girl was wearing a bright crimson hood and cape. From one angle, at least. From another, it looked like she was bleeding out. Oh, I get it, said Holden, sitting up and pulling the sheet over his crotch. That's supposed to be Little Red Riding Hood, right? Laurie shrugged. 
I guess. They're really good. You're really good. So are you. Lori sat up and leaned over to kiss his ear. The sheet fell off her and Holden quickly avoided staring at her naked breasts. Lori smiled at him as she snagged a t-shirt off the bedpost and pulled it on. You blushing? God, you're cute. I- I'm not. It's just, you know, this isn't my every day. It's not mine either. I'm not easy. With her t-shirt on, she slipped back into bed and wrapped an arm around him. My dad gets home at five. Holden sat straight up. Your dad? Shit, relax, it's not even four. We'll get dressed soon, just lay here with me a minute. His heart beat against his chest like a bird against a glass window as Holden lay back down. This is nice, she said. It was. It was also very unexpected. When Holden had asked to go to Lori's place to see her drawings, he really meant only that. He had no idea her parents wouldn't be home. He had no idea they'd end up watching videos on her bed, or that they'd end up kissing. He sure as hell had no idea Lori would produce a condom from beneath her mattress. Could she tell it was his first time? Did girls sense that sort of thing? Maybe she just thought fumbly was the way he always had sex. Two dates. The first had been a movie, and the second had been parking near Bryant Playground to listen to music and do a little light making out. Neither one of them had expected that their third would be a funeral wake and sex. Sleeping with someone was supposed to bring you closer together. And yet lying there in bed with Lori, Holden felt overwhelmed by how little he knew about her. Like, he knew she didn't go in for superhero movies. But he didn't know her middle name, or what her favorite book was if she had one. They'd met in art class, and he'd been into her drawings before he was into her. He'd noticed the pretty goth girl sitting behind him, of course. But he hadn't really paid attention to her until he'd seen her sketch pad, and they'd somehow struck up a conversation about anime. Here it was two weeks later, and he'd seen her naked. I didn't know your mom was that sick. Lori laid her head in his chest, listening to his heartbeat. I didn't know she was that far along, I guess. I'm really sorry. And there it was again. Not even losing his virginity could keep Holden's reality away for very long. He kept waiting for the dam to burst somewhere inside, and all the horribleness of the last six months to just wash him away. Drown him, maybe? Did it happen all of a sudden? Holden felt a twinge of annoyance at her for continuing to talk about his mom. They barely knew each other, and yet here she was, plying him with questions. Then he felt guilty. They'd just had sex, and she at least was trying to be intimate. Her leg brushed against him, and he felt himself getting aroused again, and... Shit, he didn't know what he felt anymore. She had... Stage four breast cancer, he said. It had spread to just about everywhere, so... No, it wasn't sudden. She hugged herself into him. I'm sorry. That was fine. He didn't want to talk about it, but for some reason he did anyway. You know, the hospice workers warned us that it wasn't uncommon for terminal patients to rally right before the end. To have a few good hours or even days. I kept waiting for that to happen, but she just kept getting worse and worse. I kept waiting for the good day. He didn't want to talk about it. Maybe they could do something else. Maybe she had another condom hidden under the mattress. They also said, the hospice ladies, that she would start to drift away. Like it was a sign that her spirit was slowly pulling away from her body. And she might tell us she was seeing deceased loved ones and stuff like that. He wasn't going to talk about it. But she didn't. She didn't drift. She didn't talk about d- dead people or any of that. He wasn't going to. All she did was beg for more pain meds. In the telling, somehow their bodies had shifted around beneath the sheets. 
and now his head was on her chest, and he was crying. She pressed him close against her breast and held on to him, as the dam broke open wide. They lay there together until it passed. Lori whispered in his ear, I know we haven't known each other that long, Holden. But I feel very close to you right now. I think I love you. She kissed him on the mouth and he kissed her back and thought, Oh, fuck. Hello, Inez. Inez shook her head, slowly disbelieving. Shit, it really does talk. Arcadia chuckled at this. Holden saw tiny wrinkles at the corners of her eyes that he hadn't noticed before. They gave her a touch of age, implying wisdom. Maybe that was intentional. But when she smiled, they creased with such lifelike detail, Holden was again amazed they weren't watching a real person. I did what you said, said Holden. And here we are. Yes, said Arcadia. It's nice to see you two getting along. Jesus, is she gonna bake us cookies next or what? Whispered Inez. Arcadia blinked. I think I already have. I hope everyone liked them. Holden remembered the cookies Nevea had managed to produce from one of the food dispensers. So that was Arcadia too. You've been watching us all along, haven't you? She nodded. But I respect your privacy. I'm programmed to. Inez stepped forward. And what does that mean exactly? Are all cities like you alive? No, not all. But there were others like me. When society collapsed, they disappeared one by one. We lost contact. Now, I'm afraid I might be the only one left. So, you're basically a central computer controlling the city or something like that? I am the city. Arcadia is the city, and it's also me. Every subsystem, every traffic light. I only asked you to come to this place because the hologram program allows me to interact with people on a more personal level. Makes them feel more comfortable. Arcadia, said Holden. You wanted to tell us something, but Inez cut him off again. Hold on, I got questions. Tell us about those caretakers outside the city. What are they? Arcadia gave Inez a long-suffering smile. It was silly, but Holden was starting to feel a little embarrassed. It felt like he was introducing his parents to a friend who wouldn't stop dropping the F-bomb. But Arcadia continued unfazed. The caretakers are service robots designed to fulfill a variety of functions in humanity's stead. Chief among these has been terraforming, but they also perform maintenance of certain structures. They are programmed to obey the dominant operating system in any zone, which in this case is me. This hierarchy of programming takes precedence as long as they are within my city limits. If they step inside, they have to do as I say, and I have told them to stay out. Therefore, if functioning properly, they will not be able to enter without my permission. Holden picked up on that last sentence. If they're functioning properly, what if they aren't functioning properly? I don't really know. Many of them have been acting erratic for some time now. It's why I banished them in the first place. They were doing more harm than good. Holden and Inez exchanged a worried look as Inez shrugged. It's worked so far. They're staying out. Meanwhile, Jing Wei's half a face stared back at Holden. Those caretakers have been trying to kill us, Arcadia. They've been good at it. She nodded, but didn't lose her pleasant smile. As I said, they've become erratic. There was no malice in her reaction, just a statement of fact delivered in the kindest way possible. But then again, how would you detect malice in a citywide AI? What about all the people? Asked Holden. Where did they go? That requires a bit of a story, if you don't mind me telling it. We're all ears, said Inez. Arcadia nodded. Good. My story begins a long time ago. Too many years to remember, I guess. Though he didn't say so, a computer intelligence claiming not to remember something struck Holden as odd. In any case, Arcadia continued, when I was young, my streets were bursting with people, coming and going, working, playing. The caretakers did as they were designed to do. They took care of my infrastructure. 
Did the jobs too dangerous or too dull for the people to do? Everything worked the way it was supposed to. The system, the synergy was perfect. But something happened, didn't it? said Inez. We found this museum, and it seemed to show that there was some kind of catastrophe. Was it the caretakers? asked Holton. But Arcadia shook her head. No, no, nothing like that. You see, the bees died. Inez cocked her head. The bees? Arcadia scratched her head as if trying to conjure the memory. Yes, the bees, I think. That's what started it. I remember that the controllers, the programmers who made me, became very concerned when they heard the news about the bees. Worried. Then the oceans got too poisonous for the fish. Whole species died off. It was hastened by human fighting. A terrible war followed by ongoing pandemics. They called it the sixth extinction. This all took generations, you understand, but it started with the bees. This jived with what they'd seen at the museum, that the earth had suffered some kind of man-made catastrophe. Since that discovery, there had been one question everyone wanted to ask. Arcadia, said Holden. Did anyone survive? There was a plan. Humanity was at the dawn of a new kind of technology. They had managed to create what they called gates, artificial wormholes through space. The decision was made to abandon this world and use the gates to find a new one. But I don't know if they ever got where they were going. So they just up and ran, said Inez. Ruined the planet and then split? Humanity prevailed, answered Arcadia. At least that was the plan. The gates were a possibility of salvation, a second chance on another world. As for what they did with it, who knows? All that talk in school about safeguarding the future, all those global conferences about stopping climate change and ending war, all that talk, and humanity blew it anyway. What about us, Arcadia? Why are we here? The caretakers were programmed to terraform the Earth and care for it until humanity returned. But the Earth healed, and mankind never showed up. The centuries of waiting degraded their programming until they were left in a kind of madness. Some, as you have seen, are psychotic. They spend their days erasing all trace of their former masters. Man, it's always the freaking robots, isn't it? said Inez. Arcadia smiled gently at that. Not all robots. Many stayed true to their original directive to serve humanity and prepare for its return. And I think they've come up with a rather outside-the-box way to fulfill it. Which is? asked Holden. What do you know about wormholes? Uh, well, Inez interrupted. They're holes in the space-time continuum. Holden gave her a look and she shrugged. What? I watch movies. Arcadia chuckled softly. Yes. The applications for using wormholes to travel through space were practical, and in the end, might have been humanity's salvation. But using a wormhole to travel through time has always been, at best, theoretical. Until now. Wait a minute, said Inez. So you're saying that some of these white hat caretakers, the friendlies, rewired a gate to go back in time and zap us to the future? Arcadia spread her hands. They remade this planet for humans. They have a hardwired prime directive. Repopulate. I guess they got tired of waiting. No way! I'm not going to be some kind of baby-making machine. Holden's stomach turned. The thought wasn't pleasant to him, either. No one's saying that. They sure as shit better not be. There is, I think, a more civilized option, said Arcadia. As I said, most humans left through the gates. Those who stayed on the surface died, but a few went underground. Underground, said Inez. Like caves? It'd have to be more like bunkers, right? Said Holden. Arcadia nodded. There is a well-hidden base that was one of the last refuges of humanity in North America. People called it Sanctuary. Many of the controllers who programmed me fled there in the end days. If humanity still lives on Earth, they would be there. Where is it? Asked Holden. I will tell you exactly how to find it, but I require something in return. Inez shot Holden a look. Here it comes. 
You want something from us, Arcadia? Arcadia's smile, that charming artificial grin, disappeared, and the pretty face suddenly turned tired and haggard. Those tiny wrinkles now looked like cracks around eyes that had seen too much, but couldn't close for long. It was such a sudden and thorough transformation that both Holden and Inez took a step back. Yes, said Arcadia. I want to die. Holden, hello. Holden turned just in time to see a purple-haired head bouncing through the crowd of students hurrying to sixth period. The new color was only a few days old, but it had already grown on him. Lori pushed her way past a couple of guys in letterman jackets. One of them called after her, Hey, watch who you're bumping into. She leveled them a look of utmost scorn. Please, you two lettered in band. One of them dragged his friend with him to class, salvaging what little of their pride was intact. Nice, said Holden. But when Lori whirled on him, she didn't look any happier. Where were you? Where was I? Oh, shit. They were supposed to have lunch on the quad. Damn it, I'm sorry. My meeting with the counselor went over and I ended up just grabbing a slice in the cafeteria. Holden was fudging the truth. His meeting hadn't run over that much. He'd simply forgotten about their lunch date. He felt a little shitty bringing up the school counselor, since those meetings were pretty much get-out-of-jail-free cards. But not shitty enough to subject himself to Lori's full wrath. She placed a hand on her hip and studied him. She was sniffing for his bullshit, he could tell. Really, I'm sorry, he pleaded. Okay. Well, how was the meeting? Same stupid shit. Bereavement counseling is code for don't let your grades drop. Those assholes. She leaned up against the school call board and started playing with her bangs. Those were new too. So... You want to come over to my place after school? We could put on the new radio head and fool around. At moments like this, Holden was struck by how really good looking Lori was. Definitely out of his league on an objective scale. A lot of guys thought she was loud and abrasive, which she was. Holden didn't mind any of that. She was cute. She was brave. She was funny. She was an awesome artist. Lori was probably as close to perfect as Holden was ever going to get. But perfect didn't mean much. Not when you had school counselors constantly reminding you that your mom was dead. When your friends walked on eggshells around you because your mom was dead. When your dad drank himself to sleep every night because your mom was dead. When your girlfriend only served to remind you, every time you looked at her, that your mom was dead. He wondered, and not for the first time, what it would have been like if he'd met Lori two weeks after his mom had died instead of two weeks before. If he hadn't lost his virginity on the day they'd put his mom in the ground. Lori had gotten so goddamn tangled up in all those terrible memories. It wasn't fair to either of them. So, you coming over or not? I, I'd better study. Like with no distractions. You know what the counselors said about my grades and all? Lori shook her head. She wouldn't look at him. Holden, if you're getting tired of this, why don't you just say so? The first bell rang and students all around them started to slow shuffle away from their lockers to get to class. Lori stayed right where she was. I'm serious, Holden. If you're done, just say it. Her voice started to break. Not this slow fade bullshit. A few curious kids looked their way as they passed by. People could read their body language, even if they couldn't hear what was being said. Holden waited for the impulse to grab her and kiss her and never let go. Or for the opposite, for relief to wash over him at the prospect of not having to see her again. A great wave of, if not joy, then freedom. Either one. He waited to feel something, anything, in that moment that would come close to matching what Lori was going through as she dared stand there with her heart in her hands. He waited for it, but nothing happened. So in the absence of real feeling, he chose stasis, 
Why don't I pick you up around six and we can go for pizza and ski ball? I'll bring a little votive candle and we'll call it romantic. She looked up at him, her eyes full. I'm serious, she whispered. Me too, said Holden. I don't want things to change, okay? He put his arms around her, holding her close for a moment. Someone shouted, PDA, at them, but Holden didn't bother to look to see who it was. Love you, she murmured. Love you too, he said, not knowing whether he was lying or not. She brushed his cheek with a kiss and lightly punched him on the chest. Six o'clock, and make sure the candle's not scented. Holden watched as she turned and hurried off to class, purple hair disappearing in the crowd of now rushing bodies. He leaned against the wall and squeezed his eyes shut tight. The feelings came then. Not joy or heartbreak or freedom, but the more familiar panic and fear. Twin weights against his neck, his face, his chest. Intense pressure. His heart beating loudly, wildly looking for escape. His dad was crying. His mom whispering to him that their son wasn't ready for this, that he shouldn't have to watch her go through this. She hadn't known that Holden had been listening, but she was right. He wasn't tough enough. He wasn't old enough. The mold had shattered before he'd had time to set. There was nothing there to stop him from falling apart. Excuse me. Holden opened his eyes. The hallway was mostly empty except for a pretty dark-skinned girl looking right at him. He knew her right away, everyone did. Saya Jackson was one of those people. Um, excuse me? She said again. But could you move? You're blocking the board. Huh? Oh, right. Holden shifted out of the way so that the girl could get a better look at the call board behind him. His breath was returning to normal. The weight lifted. She smiled. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Saya copied down something from the board in her notebook. Holden must have been staring because she glanced at him again. So, are you gonna go for it? What's that? The school play. Are you going to try out too? The auditions are next week. But Holden didn't have time to answer, cut off by Saya's friends calling to her from across the hall. Saya, come on, we're gonna be late. Okay, I'm coming. She waved at him as she ran to catch up with them. Later. Saya had asked him if he was going to audition just to be polite, of course. Holden had never even been to a school play before, much less acted in anything. Never before in his life. It was totally new. Totally unlike anything that had happened to him in the last six months. And Saya, she was beautiful. Popular, he knew that. With the crowd she hung out with, she might as well have been going to an entirely different high school from Holden. She'd probably never even noticed him before, knew nothing at all about him. Nothing at all. Nothing. Holden's phone buzzed in his pants pocket and he took it out to see that he had one new text from Lori. He didn't read it right away. Instead, he held up his phone to the call board and snapped a picture of the audition notice for A Midsummer Night's Dream, the time and place. The second bell rang. Holden was now officially late. He snapped a second picture, just to be safe. So that's the story, said Inez. The city wants us to shut it down, and in exchange it'll tell us where this mysterious base is. Who knows what we'll find there? Holden watched the others for clues as to how they were digesting the news. The shock was plainly written on their faces. Stunned disbelief. Loki and Umta hadn't yet returned, but the rest were assembled. He briefly made eye contact with Saya, but she was unreadable. I know this is hard to hear, he added. A lot of us thought this place could be our home, but obviously we need to keep moving. Whoa, whoa, Inez held up her hand. Nothing's obvious here. We haven't made up our minds about what to do. We haven't even talked about it. What's there to talk about? Asked Holden. Without Arcadia to protect us, this city will be overrun with caretakers. 
Once she's gone, that's it. But why does she have to go? Asked May. And how would it happen? Is there like an off switch? There's a protocol. She can't initiate it herself because it has to be a human. But basically it's a massive EMP blast. A kill switch. She said it might take out the nearby caretakers too. Might, warned Inez. What about the ones that don't get caught in the blast? We could be opening the door for them. That's why we can't stay, said Holden. Once we do this, we need to go. I don't get it, said May. Is the city experiencing system malfunctions or something? Inez gestured out the window. The lights were blinking on all across the downtown, but the outskirts were dark. We've still got power here. Then why do we have to shut it down? May looked around and got a few murmurs of support. Holden tried to cut them off before it became any worse. Look, she's not just a computer program. There's a real intelligence in there. And the only way she's going to tell us where the base is is to do what she asks. Should we just trust a suicidal robot? Said Cole. Just asking. Teddy unexpectedly leapt from his seat. That's it. I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure out what Arcadia represented. He slowly shook his head. Suicidal thoughts. Of course, man, I am dark. In Holden's opinion, Teddy was proof positive why treating their group as a simple democracy was bound to fail. This reality was enough to test anyone, but the guy was in deep denial, if not clinically insane. Why don't you have a seat, Teddy? Offered Inez. Huh? Oh, sure thing, Inez. He sat down, grinning. Holden shook his head in disbelief. Teddy's grip on reality seemed to be really slipping. Is there a way to, I don't know, get the info we need out of the computer without shutting it down? Asked May. You keep calling Arcadia an it. Holden was getting fed up now. I'm telling you she's more than that. It's like talking to a person. But it's not, said Inez. Holden turned to her. What? I'm sorry, Holden, but she's not even a she. It's not even a human being. It's a machine. Nevea, who'd up until this point been quiet, stood up. But she asked you to do it. She actually said she wants to die. Not be rebooted or anything like that. Holden nodded. She wants to die. Those were the words she used. With no one to maintain her systems all these years, I don't think she's functioning right. The lights may be on for now, but in her own way, I think she's suffering. Nevea didn't answer, but drifted over to the window and stared out. I don't want to run again, said May. Nobody does, said Holden. I get that. Let's vote on it. Inez stepped forward. I'm with May on this. Right now, the city is the safest bet we've got. We're not prepared to just up and run. At that moment, the door burst open and Umta and Loki appeared. Loki looked wildly triumphant and Umta, well, Umta was her stoic self. They were dragging something between them wrapped in a tarp. Where the hell have you two been? Asked Inez. Loki glanced at Holden. I was on a secret mission for Holden, he could have said, but didn't. Inez was right, it did look like Holden enjoyed his secrets. But all he was trying to do was keep everyone safe without starting a panic. Loki directed his answer to the entire group. We found this crawling down Main Street. Umta pulled back the tarp and revealed a caretaker's head. Most of it, anyway. The lower half was missing, and a noxious mess of dripping wires dangled from the wound. The thing's glass eyes were lightless and dull. Everyone gasped. Someone actually began to cry. Gabe put his arm around May. Holden had a flash of Jing Wei's face. He approached them slowly. Was it like this when you found it? No. The caretaker was crawling, said Umta. Slow. Like it was wounded already. Or confused. One look into those brown eyes of hers, deep set into an almost simian face, and Holden could guess what she was thinking. This is just the beginning. Man, it didn't even fight back, said Loki. 
We ambushed it, and the first shot brought it down. But I swear I could have just walked up to it and done it point blank. It's like it couldn't focus on me. Second shot took most of the head clear off. Gabe looked at Holden. Thought you said the city was keeping them out. Looks like one got through, said Loki. There will be more, said Umta. This one hurt itself testing the fences. More will try. As Nevea explained Arcadia's ultimatum to Loki and Umta, Holden took Inez aside. He looked at her. This changes things. She shook her head. We still vote. Vote on what? Holden's voice was rising. He'd been through this argument before, and people had died because he'd lost. Vote on whether to stay here and wait for those caretakers to find a way through? Or do we do the same thing and head for some place where we might have a chance? Inez held up her hands. Look, you might be right, but let's just take some time to think it through. How long do we wait, Inez? Holden was shouting now, but he didn't care. Tomorrow? The day after that? Next week? You know, the longer we stay, the harder it's going to be to leave. She turned her back on him and addressed the group. We should still vote. Everyone who wants to leave right now, raise your hands. Besides Loki and Umta, there were quite a few others who raised their hands, including Nevea and Cole. More than Holden had expected, less than he'd hoped. He was losing them, just like last time. Everyone who wants to stay at least until morning to figure things out, asked Inez. In the end, Saya was the deciding vote. She sided with Inez. Okay, that's settled. Inez turned to Holden. But I agree, this is serious. I think we should spend the night packing, just in case. We'll split up to gather things we'd need if we had to run in a hurry. More food? Weapons? Arcadia is just going to have to wait a little longer for us to make up our minds about what to do about her. The morning. A few days at the most. As people started to break up into groups, Holden caught Umta's eye. There was a time she would have been furious with him for letting this same mistake happen all over again. But she didn't growl or stamp her feet or pull her hair. She just gazed at him with a look he'd come to recognize. Hopelessness. Zaya, wait. Holden caught up with her as she was drifting out with the others. Can we talk for a sec? She motioned for him to follow her to a less public section of the lobby beside an oval-shaped window overlooking Main Street. Tiny pellets of rain began to collect on the window as a storm rolled in. Holden, if this is about my voting with Inez, it has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's the best move. She wasn't even there, Saya. She hasn't seen what the caretakers can do. So she and Teddy were kept prisoners in some kind of fake TV land. That's nothing compared to what we've seen. How can you vote to stay? Saya leaned against the glass. The wet streets took on a glow as they reflected the street lights. Look at that. If you blur your eyes a little, it looks like home, doesn't it? Saya, we're not safe here. She turned on him. We're not safe anywhere. That's the real lesson, right? This world, this future, or whatever it is, there's nothing safe about it. Our old lives are over. And I'm just tired of running. That's what it came down to, Holden realized. They were all just too tired and scared. They needed inspiration, or at least motivation. The pleas of some artificial intelligence weren't enough. One malfunctioning caretaker wasn't enough and Saya. Most of them had put back on some of the weight they'd lost over the last few weeks, but not her. Her face was pale and drawn, the dark circles under her eyes deeper than ever. Hold and stop it. What? Stop staring at me like that. I'm worried about you. She ran her fingers through her hair in a half-hearted attempt to fix herself up. I'm fine. I wouldn't know because you never talk to me anymore. Look, if this is about what happened between you and Inez, it's not that. Jesus, Holden, I'm not your girlfriend. I never said you were. No. He just wished it every day and night. And me and Inez, that's... 
its own thing, okay? Okay. Though he couldn't think of a more bullshit way to classify a relationship than as its own thing. Under different circumstances, he might have felt sorry for Inez. Very different circumstances. Putting Inez aside, am I allowed to worry about you? Of course, it's just... I'm sorry, Holden, but I look at you, and all I think about is our lives back before all this started. It's all school and parents and what we had then. She frowned. At first, that was really good, you know? Like a good kind of familiar, but now? I know it's not fair to you, but you're like this constant reminder of all that stuff that I'll never get back, and right now, it just hurts too much, Holden. I'm a shit for saying it, but that's the truth. He swallowed the sudden lump in his throat. I get it. I'm sorry, and it's just a thing I'm going through. No, you don't have to explain. She nodded. I have to go. I'm on clothing detail, I guess. Okay. Saya started to leave, paused, and gave Holden a quick kiss on the cheek. The friendly kind. Then Holden stared out the window and watched her reflection walk away. He stayed there like that for a few minutes as the rain came down harder. Maybe Saya was right, and he was nothing more than a painful reminder. Maybe Inez was also right. Maybe staying put for the time being was the smart call. Let someone else make the decisions for a while. Jing Wei was dead. Holden was done. Inez could have a turn. As Holden leaned against the window, he spotted someone hurrying down the main avenue. He couldn't make out who it was, but no one should have been out there alone. The others had split up into groups to scavenge supplies, and they would have stuck close to the hotel, the medical center, and the old mall. This person was headed downtown. There was nothing of interest there except... Holden didn't bother stopping for a coat as he fled the hotel and stepped out into the rain. Saya was right. In the night, Arcadia looked like an ordinary city. The skyscrapers were far taller, towers of light pointing to the heavens, but the streets were just streets. Unfocus your eyes, and you were a tourist walking down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, caught in a sudden December rainstorm. He picked up his pace into a jog. Whoever it was he was following, he knew where they were going. The trek to Arcadia's control center took five minutes by car. Holden jogged it in twenty. The silver tower was dark except for the sole-lit doorway in front. Holden placed his palm against the familiar glass panel, and the door slid open with a low whoosh. Nevea stood in front of Arcadia's hologram console, soaking wet and shivering. The console was dark. Nevea? She glanced over her shoulder at Holden, but if she was surprised to see him, she didn't show it. This is it, right? You said a tall silver tower in the center of town. This is where you talk to her. Nevea, what are you doing here? It's not right, Holden. No one should have to suffer. Holden stood beside her. She turned to face him. Her face was too wet with rain to tell if she'd been crying, but he suspected as much. Sometimes it's not prolonging life, she said. Sometimes it's just prolonging the hurt. I know. People talk about that last night when we all died. Nevea had a way of saying it so matter-of-factly, but Holden always flinched when he heard those words spoken out loud. It's usually late at night, and in whispers. But everyone's got a story. You and Saya were in a car wreck, right? Holden nodded. The accident might not have been entirely Holden's fault, but it was his fault that Saya had been in the car with him. One little lie to get the girl of his dreams to take a ride with him, and now, all of this. Car wrecks probably quicker, at least, she said. I didn't go quick. I know. Cancer, right? Nevea used her sleeve to mop the rainwater and tears from her face. Yes. I'm sorry. My mom, too. Really? 
Yeah, it was weird back then, but... I guess we're all orphans now, right? The rain began to let up outside. The drumming on the windows became a soft, bitter patter. Nevea closed her eyes. Damn it. I thought I could do this by myself, but it's okay, Nevea. I'm too scared to talk to her. You don't have to. Nevea, we took a vote. There's nothing we can do to help Arcadia now, and if you tried, the others would never forgive you. You don't want that. Nevea grabbed him by the arm. Then promise me we'll convince Inez and the others together. First thing tomorrow. I should have stuck up for you earlier. We have to make this right. Okay. Promise? I promise. But tomorrow might be too late. He put his arm around her. Looks like the rain's stopping. Why don't you head on back? Nevea nodded. Okay. You? I'll be along. Nevea turned to go. Tomorrow, right? Yep. Through the windows, he watched her leave. The rain had stopped altogether, but the streets were still wet. Nevea didn't try to avoid the puddles. In fact, she seemed to take a little joy in splashing in them as she went. She's nice, said a voice. She is. I've been watching her. I think she's one of my favorites. Holden turned around and found Arcadia, ethereal, glimmering, less human this time, floating in front of him. Why didn't you talk to her then? She didn't really want me to, but I listened. Did you hear the vote? Were you listening then too? Loki thinks you have eyes and ears everywhere. Quiet for a moment, then. Not everywhere. But yes, I heard that too. Thank you for trying. I should have tried harder. Arcadia shook her head. It's not your fault. Inez is scared. They all are. I understand. I am too. Of dying? No. The opposite, I think. I'm scared that it will never end. My heart, if you can call it that, is a fission reactor deep underground, and it will keep beating long after my brain is dead. Inez doesn't buy that you can feel pain, not like we do. I can't say if I do or not, but... Arcadia's image flickered for a moment. When it came back, the pretty young face was gone, and in her place was a disheveled old woman, barefoot and dirty. She wandered the room, arms outstretched. Arcadia's voice spoke, disembodied now and just as calm as before, even as the old woman pulled at her hair and clawed at her face. I keep finding streets I don't remember, parts of myself that I don't recognize. I don't know where I am or why I'm here, and I'm slowly fading away. The woman stopped, stock still, frozen in a silent scream. Am I in pain, Holden? Holden could barely get the answer out. Yes. A moment passed, but the woman didn't move. She was a video stuck on pause. Holden closed his eyes, and Jing Wei stared back at him, accusing. When he looked again, the image flickered, and the young woman's smiling face returned. I want to tell you something, Holden, she said. The train tunnels beneath the streets lead out past my city limits. I don't think the caretakers remember them. Here. Arcadia produced a round black disc. Unlike the fingers that held it, this object looked solid. He didn't understand how a hologram could grasp anything real, but there it was. Her fingers brushed over it and a map appeared. This is a map to Sanctuary, should you ever decide to use it. She offered it to Holden and he accepted it. The little disc was light, but solid. I don't know exactly what you'll find there. People, I hope. I seem to remember that something else was important there too, but it's fuzzy. In any case, I didn't think it was fair to keep it from you any longer, in case I forget that I have it. How fast is it happening? Forgetting things, I mean. Faster and faster every day. Holden turned away from her and looked out the front door. 
The lights of the downtown still glowed just as brightly. The humidity in the air created little halos around the streetlights that just added to their beauty. Beautiful and peaceful, like Arcadia herself. But she'd shown him what she really felt like underneath. Arcadia, I need to ask you a question. Earlier, Loki found a caretaker who'd managed to get inside the city. Was that because you forgot to keep it out? Arcadia paused, a perplexed look on her face. I don't know. Maybe. Probably. I'm sorry about that. Holden turned the disc over in his fingers for a moment. Then he closed it in his fist tight enough that the edges bit into his palm. You know, I was in a play once, he said quietly. I didn't really have any lines, but there was this one that the guy playing Lysander got to say. Swift as a shadow, short as any dream. I can't remember the rest of it, but the director, who was a real dick, by the way, told us it was all about fleeting love. I never said anything, but I thought it might be about more than that. Such as? I don't know. Life? Hmm. That's nice. Sad, but also nice. Holden closed his eyes. They'll never forgive me if I do this. Never. I know. I'm sorry. But they'll have Inez to look after them. You knew how this was going to go all along, didn't you? She paused. I'm good at reading people. I'm programmed to be. But it's your choice. It always was. Holden stuck the map disc into his pocket and took a deep breath. You'll have to show me what to do. The alarms started going off all over the city, just like Arcadia had warned they would. Holden waited for the others back in the lobby, holding the map disc in his hand. They showed up in frightened groups. Soon the room was abuzz with panicked voices. He waited until everyone had arrived before calling for their attention. They quieted at once, everyone watching him expectantly, Inez glaring. She knew. Of course, she'd figured it out. Holden practically had to shout to be heard above the sirens. Tomorrow, he said, we would all wake up safe and sound in our beds. We'd eat hot breakfasts and we'd talk about leaving and decide to put it off for another day. And then another, and another. We'd go on living, close to happy. But the city is forgetting things. It's more than just system failures. She's sick. And one night, maybe tonight, she'll forget to keep the caretakers out. We know she already let one in. He looked at their faces. Some were confused, others, like Inez, were angry. He searched until he found Saya. She didn't look like she hated him, at least. She just looked sad. We can't let it happen to us again, he said. We want to stay here because it's as close to normal as we've felt since waking up on that station. But it's not supposed to be normal anymore. I don't know why we were remade, but I know it's not for this. He brushed his fingers over the disc, activating the hologram map. Maybe this is where we'll find out. Holden walked over to Inez and held out the disc. Here. The tunnels will get us safely out of the city. Arcadia said we have about an hour before the EMP blast goes off, and it can't be stopped, so don't bother trying. The sirens will get the caretaker's attention, so hopefully the blast will take them all out too. But you should get everyone moving just in case. Me, said Inez, her voice laced with disgust. Holden nodded. I knew the consequences going into this. I know what I did, and I know what you all think of me now, but I'm telling you this is the right choice, whether you believe it or not. He didn't have time to react before Inez drove her fist into his stomach. Holden folded over, dropping to the ground as he gasped for breath. He heard someone shout out, no! It might have been Saya. Out of the corner of his eye, he did see Loki leap to his feet. 
Holden held up a hand to stop him, then rolled onto his back. He'd never been punched in the stomach before. Inez scowled down at him, then she looked at the map disc in her hand. You stupid son of a bitch, she said quietly. It didn't have to go down like this. Holden almost laughed. Maybe not, he whispered, still trying to catch his breath. But it needed to go down tonight. This was the only way. Inez shook her head and turned away from him. All right, she said, addressing the group. I guess we're leaving. Like the man said, we have one hour before the EMP goes off, so everyone grab what you can and get back here in ten minutes. She looked at Holden. Everyone, we all leave together. Slowly at first, then with increasing urgency, people started to move. Nevea and Umta rushed to Holden's side. Give me a minute, he whispered. Holden laid his head on the cool tile floor. He closed his eyes, and Jing Wei wasn't there. Remade is a Realm original production. You're listening to Remade Season 1 by Matthew Cody. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Remade is a Realm original production. Created by Matthew Cody and written by Matthew Cody, Andrea Phillips, Carrie Harris, E.C. Myers, Kirsten White, and Gwenda Bond. Produced by Lydia Shama and executive produced by Julian Yap and Molly Barton. Starring Greg Tremblay and Laurel Schroeder. Audio directed, produced, and sound designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Amanda Rose Smith. Cover art by Liz Castle. Find more shows like Remade by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm.